At InDigital, we know that public safety professionals hold themselves to a high standard. In fact, standard doesn't do it justice. In over 25 years working alongside you, carrying millions of calls over our IP networks, your dedication has inspired us. That's why our ESI net goes beyond industry standards, not only I3 compliant, but designed to adapt to future development for a network you can count on when it matters most. Learn more at indigital.net. Here in Greenville County, we have eight different places where a 911 call can be answered. It is the largest county in South Carolina. It's a challenge. The type of information that a telecommunicator gets from Radius Plus is location-based technology. You can see where the caller is, if they have a medical issue, if they speak a different language. They're immediately able to text to that caller in their native language. It reduces response times because it immediately gets first responders where they need to be. Carbine, it's multimedia. You can get text, translate to whatever language, getting away with the legacy equipment and going into a cloud-based solution. It's the first time in U.S. history that we have an EziNet through cloud-native call handling. As a police officer, to have the victim go video, that's un unheard of. You're getting upgrades every month, not every year. To schedule your free Carbine demo, please visit carbine.com WTT. If Within the Trenches has ever taught you something, open your eyes to what it is like to be a 9-1 dispatcher or has inspired you to become one, then help support us and join our Patreon. Get exclusive bonus content, one-of-a-kind swag, discounts on merchandise, ad-free early access to new episodes, and much more. To join, please visit patreon.com slash WTT podcast. And if you're an industry partner, we have something for you as well. And now for the show. This is Jordan, and you're listening to the Code 7 Podcast Network. Warning. This episode contains the three A's of podcasting. Adult content, adult language, and awesomeness. You've been warned. Welcome to Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. Hey, what's going on? This is Ricardo with the Code 7 Podcast Network, and we are about to get started with Within the Trenches, true stories from the 911 dispatchers who live them. This episode is sponsored by InDigital, Rapid Deploy, as well as Carbine, and a big shout out to patrons, as always, for everything. This week is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week 2022, and uh, it's actually, it's the second day. It started on April 10th. Today is April 11th, and there are pictures all over social media about this. This is your week, and actually, it's not just your week. It's your week every week, but this one is special, and uh, it's just, it's it's a great one. So I hope that you are all having an excellent week already so far and that you will have the rest of the week that's going to be awesome uh, because you deserve it. Not a lot of people can do the job that you do and you are the most vital piece of public safety. So thank you for everything that you do as part of the Thin Gold Line and also for those who have shared stories for the I Am 91 movement. Thank you so, so very much. And uh, there's there's a lot of content that's going to be coming your way this entire week. There are tons of things going on, and uh, I, I can't say enough about it. There's just so many things going on. We've got a live broadcast that will be happening um, all week. And then, um, you know, we've, we're real deep into um, conferences. So I'll be heading over to uh, several conferences, doing Imagine Listening, uh, recording episodes of the podcast with attendees. And it just continues and continues. So make sure to look out for all of that excellent content coming your way with powerful stories from those within the trenches of 911. Again, thank you all for everything that you do. I'm excited for my guest today, and uh, we're going to be talking about so many different things, learning about her background uh, in dispatch, but also um, you know, a training course that she had uh, created and things that she's doing right now. She's working on her PhD as well. And my guest today is Angela Johnson. She's a licensed professional counselor uh, working with first responders and trauma, and she's a dispatcher for 18 years. 
Hello. Hey, how are you? I am doing good. It is it is awesome to have you here. We had previously scheduled an episode about a month or so ago, right? Something like that. And then some stuff happened that was kind of funny. <laughs> and uh, um, here we are, though. It's it's good to have you here. I'm excited to, to learn about you. And uh, this is good. I'm glad to finally have you on. Yeah, me too. It's glad to be here. I told my husband, I said, don't go play with the rookies right now. I need to do this podcast. You're not getting hurt today, okay? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he he ended up working with a few people and 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 got a little got a little hurt, but it was okay. And uh, I just I I just remember in your email it said something like uh, rookie one, husband zero, or something <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but the rookie was like this, and hubby's like this, and even with all the padding, you know, he took a hit and got a free few little broken bones and so I was like and this is fun how <laughs> right. I don't know how do, you, how do you call this fun I, yeah. I don't know I was, like, it. I was like come on husband like explain explain this like how yeah how is this so good <laughs> Oh, that is that is funny. Well, you're here now, and this is good. And I'm glad that he's okay and everything is well. And uh, so let's let's go ahead and start out. Let's let's go back in time, and because uh, we've got a lot to cover here and everything. But I, you had 18 years in yeah. dispatch. You ended up leaving uh, in 2016, and we're going to get to that part. But how did you get started in in public safety to begin with? I was working as you know, I was, I was young. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was working in, I think it was purchasing at the time for a government contractor. And I was like, I cannot sit here at this desk and do paperwork anymore. I was like, I couldn't do it. So there was an opening for EMS training. So I tried that and I was like, well, yeah, no, that is a little too up close and personal for me. <laughs> <I was like, laughs> nope. Uh, so <laughs> I went into dispatch I saw that there was an opening there. I said, oh, this will be fun. You know, I get to answer calls and also I get to tell police what to do. And I was like, hey, can't get any better than this. I was like, this is great. I was like, that's for me. So that's where I went and stayed for a long time. So did you, did you get a chance though to, because so you went through, with EMS, it was up and up close and personal, like you said. But with dispatch, did you get a chance to do like a sit along? Like, did you get a chance to go in there, or was it just really kind of listening to the radio? And you're like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. I might want to do that instead. No, not originally, um, because I had started out in EMS for a little while. I was familiar with the radio room, mm -hmm. and just from you know they would give us calls and things like that. So I was like, okay, I can do this. It's sort of along the same lines as answering the emergency calls, but I'm not the one that has to go out there and actually pick people up. So I was like, okay, this is at least something that is close to what I want to do because I really wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to, I have to ask when, when you say, you know, how the, the up close and personal really wasn't up, uh, it was, it really wasn't for you. Do you remember some of the things that, you know, were going on that you thought, mm, yeah, this is not, I'm not down with this. No, <laughs> and you don't have to go into detail or anything, but I mean, like, was it just some of the things that you saw, you know, people who were, you know, calling for help and, and you're seeing this right there and it was just kind of shocking or. I had to shake my pants legs out one time after going into an apartment for, um, roaches and I was like yeah no mm -mm, not me <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> See, no, mm -mm. that that is something that I would have never thought about because mm -hmm. you're right you know there are some times that um, you know, and, and everyone's living condition is different. Yes. And, 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 and you, you really don't think about that. Like, I would have never thought about that, you know, going into someone's home that, uh, that, that is like that, you know, that, that might, you know, be infested with roaches or fleas or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember hearing a story once where someone had said that they had gone into a home, uh, to help out some children and, um, 
I don't remember what kind of thing it was that they were going out to, but th there were some children there they were th that they were checking on. I, I think maybe it was a welfare check, and mm -hmm. and it was like that. You know, there was it was infested with like fleas and stuff, and they were explaining how they were they were jumping and everything. But that's some that's one of the things that you don't always think about. It's more so when someone says, you know, we we went out to a certain call and and someone had you know a broken arm, and although it's just a broken arm, um, it's not just a broken arm because the bone was like protruding, you know, and you could see everything, you know, and then they're like, oh, that probably wasn't for me. But, but that's almost like a, a given, right? When you're, when you're thinking about going out to like a medical, it's mm -hmm. not more so all the time going and it's the living conditions that some folks might be in, whatever the case may be. And, and, and like you said, you had to shake your pant leg. When you mentioned shaking your pant leg out, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> but, but yeah, that's something that you have to look out for because that, yes. that stuff will go home with you. Yes. Yes. It, it they'll travel with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So then, so then you're out there and, uh, you know, you, you're getting some hands-on experience and, and you're going through a bunch of different things and then that incident happens and you're just kind of, eh, that's probably not the thing. So when you, when you end up thinking about uh, dispatch and, and, you know, and applying and you, you're, you're going to get in there, what was that like in the beginning then? Was there, you know, the, even with your, um, with your interview, you know, how, how was that for you? How did everything happen as you were going into dispatch? I went for my interview and because I had a little bit of prior experience, I was able to give a bolo. And he was like, oh, we're going to hire you right now. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> so, uh, and then I had started and got into training and I was excited because I was interested in it. And I thought it was going to be something that was not only fun, but worthwhile mm -hmm. too. See, that's, that's pretty awesome that you were able to spit out, uh, I'll be on the lookout right away and then be like, we're taking you, you're coming Got in, it. you're going to. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna go ahead and do this. So that that first day, you know, that first shift, what was that like going in? Like, if you do, you remember walking in and seeing everything? Like, can you kind of paint a picture for us of what that was like for you? Because I started at the end of August of 2001, mm -hmm. and then right in the beginning of training is when September 11 happened, and the city that I was working for is. We're in the city with the world's largest naval base. Oh, so wow. the calls, it, what they call it, baptism by fire. Mm -hmm. It was like the calls were just insane. There were so many coming in so fast all the time. It was like, oh, when I wanted to do this, I was like, okay, all right. Uh, so we, in the beginning of the training, we got to sit in the radio room and actually see and listen to some of these calls that were coming in. And I said, like, okay, all right, I can do this. But yeah, this is going to be good. Mm -hmm. It was very fast, very busy. How many, how many people are working on the floor at a time? And, and was it, were they eight hours or 12 hour shifts? At the time it was eight hour shifts. We would rotate mm -hmm. every 28 days all the way around. And the minimum staffing, I believe it was 15, but minimum staffing for the whole center or those who are on the floor at a time for the whole center, minimum staffing oh, okay. was supposed to be 15 for each shift on the floor. But, uh, as the years went on and staffing became shorter, there were times we would luck be, we would have seven or eight mm -hmm. maybe. So it was, yeah. No lunch, no breaks. So a pretty big area then, I'm guessing that you were covering for sure, because just in comparison for the, the central dispatch that I, I worked for where I, where I finished mm -hmm. off my dispatching career, um, our if we were at full staff, I think it was 22. Mm -hmm. And on the floor at a time um, throughout the week was three. Oh, Three yeah. people on the floor was our minimum. And over the weekend, four people. We had a fifth console if things were going to hell. But uh, um, usually it was only three of us. 12 hours a day running the entire county with multiple agencies. Yeah. No, we had 15 mm -hmm. supposed to be on the floor. Man, so it was a, a pretty nice <laughs> client agency. Yeah. 
So when you when you think about it, and you're and you're sitting at your console, mm -hmm. if you were to like sit up to look over, what do you see? Is it just like a big cube farm and everyone just working, or or are there like separate pod areas? Separate pod areas. So mm -hmm. you would go in, and there would be the call taker section, three pods. It has since changed many times, and you know we have the carpet on the walls. Yes. No windows. Everybody's got the carpet. No windows. And then you would have fire and EMS dispatch over here on one side. And then you would have the, um, it was back then, three police precincts plus detectives. So there would be the four consoles there that were occupied plus an extra in case everything went to hell. We had an opportunity to open up that one. And then in the middle, you would have the supervisor's console. And majority of the time, there were two on duty. Oh, man. So what was the training like then in the beginning? And, and the reason I ask, and I always ask everyone, of course, because I always like to compare how training is done in every center. Because like for us, we had four different phases. So mm -hmm. your first phase was just like, you know, the geography, the codes, protocols, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff. And then you go to non-emergency line and you're working on phones. And then you would go to radios. And then so all those phases were going through. And then that fourth phase was our shadow phase. And that's where our trainer would be on the other side of the room. But it's just the trainee with the rest of the staff working like a well-oiled machine. But if any, but if they needed anything, the trainer was there just in case. But they were just like the word is. They're just shadowing. Just shadowing, right? It's something similar. The training would come in, I think it was like 10 weeks of actual classroom. And then you would go in and you would like listen to dispatchers, um, plug in with them. And then you, after graduation, you would go to call takers. But our center rotated every two hours between call take and dispatch. So you would rotate as well. So every two hours you were switching between call taker and dispatch and you were listening for a while maybe doing one or two things or start picking up calls. And then you would go, you would separate from your trainer. You would go in one pod, the trainer would go in the other until you were actually released. And it took about a year and a half, maybe to two years until you were fully trained and you were on your own. That's how yeah. the training went. That's yeah, that's, it's pretty similar. I, Mm -hmm. And and, and I, I like how all of that is, especially because there's there's so many variables, right? When you're when you're working in this profession and the amount of people that you're working with. The, the only thing for me, though, that was hard in the beginning was that when when I went from one trainer to the other on my um, on my reports, I would get marked down sometimes because I wasn't I was doing the stuff that the other that the previous trainer had taught me to do with the new trainer. So then I'm getting marked down for it. And I remember saying to the person, like, why, why am I getting marked down for this? And that person would say, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm doing it a certain way. So I want you to do it this way. Yes. And I, I was like, well, wait, that isn't why, but why are you marking me down? So it was for me, it was enough to where, um, I mean, I almost quit. I, I, I remember talking to the assistant director at the time, the deputy director rather at the time and saying, I don't understand what's going on, but I, I keep getting marked down. Even when I find a new way on my own to do it, that's more, that's faster for me and more efficient. There's got, something's got to give and it, things mm -hmm. changed after that, but there was an issue when I, when I was training. There was in the beginning too, because the training was not uniform. And they would just put you with the dispatchers that had volunteered to train, or sometimes they were voluntold to train. And you would go and it would be according to however that dispatcher would do things. Mm -hmm. And you would have to do it like they did. But then as soon as you went to someone else, you had to learn their way of doing it. Which it could have been frustrating, but I can also see how it helps you learn the various ways to get to the same end goal mm -hmm. to where when you get out on your own, you can figure out your own way that works for you. Right. You know, uh, one of the, one of the previous episodes, I was talking to somebody about their training and they were telling me that what they do is 
when they switch trainers, they have about a week or so where they don't grade anything no. because they want them to get uh, acquainted with that new trainer and how they run through things so that the transition is smooth. And I thought, that's pretty good. I, that's kind of, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's different. We didn't do it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't either. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I thought that was a, it was a cool thing um, that they were doing. And, and yeah, you know, it, it allows them to really get comfortable and all, and, and, and also not have that fear right off the bat of, yes. are they marking me down on this? What am I doing? Yeah. Am I doing something wrong? Did I not I say that right? You know? <laughs> Yep, exactly. So when you, when you end up getting through, um, you know, through your training and everything, or even through the training, you know, what were some of those, um, earlier calls, uh, that you were taking? Do you remember any of those? Uh, anything and everything, uh, funny ones, a lot of regulars that would call, you know, on Friday nights, they'd call and sing. I like those. Those were fun. Um, <laughs> I had, there were a lot of. Um, poor kid. One of my favorite ones. I felt so bad for him. He was doing certain things with being gay when his parents weren't home. Oh no. Oh yeah. And he was, he was hurting so bad. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. But I was like, you're underage. We have to get your parents. They have to know about this. So, oh no. Yeah. That's, that's one of those things where it's, it's just, it's not the same, but when you're, when you're, when we're talking about like minors and such, it's, um, I remember a lot of weekends that I would be working, uh, midnights mm -hmm. and officers would show up out of nowhere to break up a party. And, uh, either they had heard about it or someone had called that there was a loud music going on somewhere and it might be a party or something, but they just wanted them to turn it down. And it turned out that it was minors that were at a party and then you know they're drinking and everything else and then i have to be the one to call the parents <laughs> and say um hey uh, so yeah. and so is out with one of our officers and uh they need you to go out there and i remember one specifically said was he drinking and i said uh ma'am i'm i'm not sure they just need you to go over there it's underage party they're I've been there, there is alcohol there, but I don't know if your kid has been drinking or anything. And I, I remember hearing her say to her husband, I know, I know yeah. they've been drinking. I know it. We're going to get over there. I was like, okay, I just, please um, be safe as you're going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah. But for your call, you know, with, with the, with the Ben Gay and everything, I mean, so this is this is something that uh, you know we can kind of hit on a little bit here, because in this profession, mm -hmm. when you're talking to someone, you you have to have um, you know that ability to continue the conversation, not just getting that pertinent information, but you have to continue that conversation to also help the caller and calm them down a little bit. Yes. In any situation, because people are going out there to help them, but you don't want them freaking out and you want to try to comfort them. But when it's when it comes to something like that, you know, what do you do? <laughs> click. You just click your mic and you just breathe. <laughs> and then you, you turn your sound back on and then you continue. It's like you have to just uh, push it through and then you play your tape back afterwards and maybe listen to it and like, Oh gosh, I gotta listen to this one. <laughs> right. Because in, in, it's also a way to, you know, help um, those who are coming in, you know, to work with mm -hmm. you all as well. The, the newer folks that are coming in that, that next generation that's coming in and stuff, some of those tapes like that, I'm not saying that that, that tape ended up being one, but some of some calls like that end up being ones that are used to show people, look, if you want to get into this, you know, these are some of the calls that you're going to listen to. And I know a lot of places have started playing calls early on in the beginning so that people know what they're getting into, because there have been times, um, and, and I know this from experience, there have been times where we had people come in 
and they were thinking, you know, they were all badass and stuff and, and they could do it. And, and, and they were doing some, but it, all it took was that first like major emergency to come in and they were done. They didn't right. want to do it. Mm -hmm. And everything is recorded. So, you know, yes. when you get that call, they're going to pull it. They're going to either pull it for training or they're going to pull it for court or for the detectives to come and listen it to. And so, you know, that you start playing it back in your head. So like, mm -hmm. did I do this right? Did I say what I was supposed to say? Because I know everybody from this point forward is going to be listening to my call. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it is, I think it is important to take those priority calls and have the trainees listen to in the beginning of training to see, okay, is this something that you want to pursue? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of times too with, uh, you know, different centers that allow for sit-alongs for people to come mm -hmm. in who are thinking about, um, you know, getting into this profession. But right. there are a lot of times that people come in and there's nothing going on. You know, they sit there for two or three hours, sometimes All four days. hours. <laughs> yeah. And nothing happens. And they're like, I can do this. You're like, wait, no, you've got to be, you have to come in when there's a drunk driving grant going on or when there's a full moon. Yeah, then you get a <laughs> or a holiday, you know, after the family's been together for too long on a Sunday and then everybody starts fight, drinking and fighting. That's when you got to right. every time that there was a visitor, nothing would happen. We're like, why don't you just stay and, then, you know, be calm for the rest of the night? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, you don't always get a true depiction of what 911 is. And then you get folks coming in who think that that's that's all it is that we're just chilling there waiting for something to happen and it's sometimes rare moments it can be like that where you know things might not be happening at all and you're just kind of there and uh but then the majority of the time it's just call call call, call, call. And you don't yes you don't get a chance to breathe you don't get a chance to eat you don't get a chance to go to the bathroom no. you're no. there <laughs> taking calls over and over and over over and over again yes so you you know you did this for 18 years and all but mm -hmm. at what point did you feel like you really had a hold of 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 this job like for me it was like two and a half three years or so like i knew what i was doing i knew the protocols like i was i was doing well but you don't always feel like you're 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 doing it you know, where you, you feel like you, you are confident in everything, but there's a moment where you're like, man, I, I really got this. And this is, this is what I'm here to do. This is what I was meant to do. I think it was around year five where mm -hmm. I was really feeling comfortable that I, you know, I knew my codes and knew the officers, um, fire and EMS, you know, had all the policies down and could take the phone calls no problem. Now, did you ended up becoming, you know, a supervisor as well. About how many years into your dispatching career did you end up becoming a supervisor? It was the last five years that I was there, I was supervisor. Now, what made you want to make that transition? Was it was it something in your training or just things that were going on there that wanted to, you know, that you wanted to move up? And the reason I ask is because there's a lot of times where folks have talked about how, and especially during training, whether they had a really good trainer and they wanted to be able to instill those, uh, you know, those techniques or the way, you know, they treated, um, you know, that person at the time. And to be able to bring that to someone else who might be coming in, so they wanted to move up, or on the same sense, the same of, of of training, maybe they had a crappy trainer, and because they had a crappy trainer or trainers, whichever, that also made them want to move up to either be a trainer or supervisor or whichever, so that they could um, mold that next generation coming in so that they wouldn't have to deal with that type of stuff either. They would have it better than what it was when they started. Right. Um, I think it was a combination of things that mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of help the next generation that is coming in. But also I was experiencing my own issues at the time um, mm -hmm. with compassion, fatigue and stress to where, okay, if I'm a supervisor, then I'm not on the phones or the radio for the entire shift anymore. But then I can focus on other things. 
So I think that's what really propelled me to go that path. Now, for, for those who are watching, um, you know, there's a, there's a large portion of the uh, general public that, that watches and listens to this podcast as well. Now, when you're talking about compassion fatigue, what is it that you mean? It's that they often call it the cost of caring. Is mm -hmm. In order for us, I still say us and we, like I'm still in there. And you always will be. I know, I know. In <laughs> order for us to do what we do, we have to care about people. We have to have empathy towards others. And compassion fatigue is that when we get to a point where we no longer have that empathy, it's the emotional and physical exhaustion that we experience from shift work, from the type of calls that we receive, um, to internalizing our own emotions, you know, because there's still a stigma mm -hmm. in public safety as a whole about seeking mental health help or even being part of CISM debriefings to process those traumatic calls. So all of this combined can create this overwhelming just exhaustion that we experience, which can be called compassion fatigue. Awesome. Thank you. And and I know compassion fatigue can be in any profession, but as we're talking about 911 and people are learning more, they continue to learn more about what it's like, um, you know, to, to be a dispatcher, call taker and all of yes. that. That's why I wanted you to kind of explain that part as well so that people get a better understanding. And and I, and I tell people all the time, you know, when, when we're taking these phone calls, as you said, as an empath, you know, we are putting ourselves in their shoes. You know, we uh, on the phone when you listen to a tape, and I and this is why a lot of times, you know, the media ends up saying, "Well, this dispatcher didn't even care because listen to their voice; they're just talking. They're at the same level or whichever." But what they don't know, but they are learning a lot more. And since around 2016, they have been learning a lot more, and the media has kind of changed a bit uh, their their you know thought process on 911 dispatchers and call takers. You know, we have to be focused. You know, we have to be mm -hmm. calm. Any change in our tone or whatever can, you know, make the caller or even, you know, someone out in the field over the radio kind of freak out a little bit. Because if they Absolutely. hear us, if they hear us change, then they're going to change as well. So we have to stay calm and focused. But in the back of our heads, we're freaking out with that caller as well. But that's why you don't hear it on those tapes. Yes. And people get, you know, this other view of what it is that we do or, or why we respond certain ways, but we have to stay focused. You know, we do have to stay focused and we dispatch according to the worst case scenario rule to where, but our mind is filling in the blank of what we don't see of the scenario of the call that we just received. And, you know, our mind is always going to make it worse than it actually is. Mm hmm but then that's the memory that we live with is the one that we created. Right. Exactly. And, and sometimes, you know, those, those are the ones that end up coming back when you don't even, you don't even think about it. You could see something in front of you, whether it be on TV or someone passing mm -hmm. by this has a description of, uh, you know, someone you might've been talking to on the phone or, you know, someone who was suicidal and, and you're, you have to put the information out for someone to look for that person, but that description stays in your mind and it ends up becoming a trigger. Yes. And it, it sucks because it hits out of nowhere. I've had a few of them and I think, wait, why am I like, you know, emotional about this? And then it hits me. Oh, that was that one call that I took. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Didn't think oh, it was oh. still there, but it was there. It's there. Now for you, you know, thinking about all of this that you were going through, mm -hmm. you know, the compassion fatigue, you ended up creating, um, actually, you know, like a, a, a session, right? You ended up doing this at, at different conferences and everything, you know, this training course. What was, what did that all entail? It was, I created a three hour training course that taught mm -hmm. dispatchers about <clears throat> the signs and symptoms of compassion, fatigue, stress, and burnout. You know, what can we do to help ourselves get through this to where that we can enjoy our profession? Because this is what we chose. This is what we love to do. And I was teaching it at different various APCO conferences and local EMS conferences. And now, I thought, 
it was helpful. And and that's good because a lot of people don't know those signs. So for, for those who are watching and listening right now, what are some of those signs that people can look out for? Well, it has a tendency to increase anxiety. You know, mm-hmm. are like for me, I can tell you about my instances. Are you playing your tapes back? Like if a caller calls in and you're giving you the address, you know that it is right. However, anxiety is increasing to where you're playing it back a couple of times to make sure that you got it right. It's like you're no longer trusting your judgment. Also, um, we have an inability to make mistakes. So that puts an extreme pressure on us with stress. So that's why we double check often. It's like we don't trust ourselves anymore. Increases depression. Are you just working because that's the only thing that you know how to do right now. You're picking up extra overtime shifts. Are you not getting out and doing things that you used to do? And also um, anxiety, depression, are you having difficulty sleeping? Now, five years of nights, I had difficulty sleeping, but it's a little bit different. Are you ruminating on calls that you had? Are you playing them back in your head over and over again when you're off work? Is that sort of like taking over your personal time? Or did you stop self-care? I know I was working so much at a time. Another coworker and I were talking about what day are you on? Like day 34. It's like, yay. Like, no, (laughs) that is not good. Yeah, it's not a badge of honor. Like, <laughs> No, it's not. Day 34 with no day off. It's like, no, that is not good, people. Um, are you avoiding things? You know, you get that trigger. Are you avoiding certain places that you like to go? Just different things like that, um, especially just being tired. Like, I don't want to pick up another phone call. Or no, I don't. Please don't make me work the radio today. Just incense like that. And then that's where it's like, okay, something is going on here. And I think the most important thing with compassion, fatigue, stress, or burnout is being intentional with your self-care. Doing things that you enjoy. Finding new things. Taking time, even if it's just in the middle of your shift, if you can, just to step outside. Because, you know, most of our bunkers, we don't have windows. Mm -hmm. Just go outside. And take care of yourself is the most important thing. Everything that you said just now, I, I flashbacked. I, I did a flashback <laughs> to to when I was in dispatch because I I was the same way. Uh-huh. You know, I, I I would I would do everything I was supposed to be doing, but then I was volunteering for uh, overtime like crazy, and uh, you know there would be you know, triggers and just all types of things, but also. You know, during that time, like it still is in a lot of places, like you know, had mentioned already, there's that stigma. I didn't want to, I didn't want to look weak. I didn't want to look like I couldn't handle it. But once I finally started sharing, you know, my stories and, mm-hmm. and, and actually doing stuff about it, um, things got a lot better. And if I could go back in time to talk to myself, I would tell myself to do certain things and, and, and really, really put that on so that, um, uh, so that I wouldn't have to deal with it. But I th- I think also, in a sense, at least for me, just speaking personally about me, going through all of that helped in a way to be able to help others yes. who are in the profession now. So that's it, that's a good thing. It ended up being a good thing. That's definitely what my goal is now, that my I've sort of progressed outside of dispatch, but still being find myself going back in there is I want to be able to be in a position to help, whether it is in expanding the knowledge of counselors that are out there and say, okay, this is a good way to help dispatchers because they need it too. They are that first, first responder. And I know people fight that, but they are because you can't get any help for service without that dispatcher. So that's why right. it's so important to me now is to have this focus going back from a mental health perspective and working with dispatchers again. 
See, and this is this is amazing because so you you went through you know compassion fatigue and all. You mm -hmm. end up developing this course. You left dispatch in 2016, but you also um, are you know part you're a crisis intervention instructor at a local police department. On top of that, you're working on your PhD. And I, I, I meant I have it in my notes here because it was in the email. You are um, you're working on your PhD, and you find yourself on this path leading back to dispatch with with this same topic. And and this is amazing yes. because you are it's it's full circle now. You know you've got all the stuff, the experience of things that you've gone through, and you're but you're also educating yourself to be able to educate and take care of those who are currently answering those phone calls. Exactly. I think it, it is important to get the word out because when I'm doing, I was, when I started my research, I found out how lacking the research is with dispatchers. Mm -hmm. As I, it's just not out there. There are a few, but it's not nearly where it should be, especially compared to police, fire, and EMS. So that is where my research is taking me is dispatchers and compassion fatigue. So with with this research and, you know, everything that you're doing, mm -hmm. are there any calls that stick with you that have kind of led you down this path to be able to, you know, help others who are, who are dealing with these as well? Uh, several. I think during my time was um, there was an individual that was shot six times mm -hmm. and I was the last person that he spoke with. And also the, I think it was nine officer down calls just during my time period that I was there. Uh, all of those stick with me. All of them. And, and, and I feel you, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of those calls that, uh, that stick with us that we're, we're also able to, to use in a way, again, as education to be mm -hmm. able to help those others that are coming in, because there might be a way that I handled it that you didn't know about and vice versa. You know, you could have handled it in a certain way that I would think I would have never thought about that. Thank you right. for, for telling me. And, and, and the, uh, just the, the self-care alone to be able to tell people to, it's okay to think about yourself. It's okay to take care of yourself because what is it that you know we're we're doing in dispatch? You know we we are helping everyone, everyone, those on the phone, those out in the field. But when it comes to one communicating with each other and two taking care of ourselves, it's gone. <laughs> and I don't know why, what? but but it but it happens, right? It does. It's almost, it's almost like we we feel like um, we don't have the right to either be happy or take care of ourselves or help each other which sucks, but things are changing. And, and, and it's conversations okay. like this that um, that are changing that that whole narrative as well. Definitely. It's like, we have to take care of ourselves before we can take some, care of somebody else. It's like, we have to. And it's not being selfish, it's, it's a priority. It's like making mm -hmm. yourself a priority. As we, as we go into the wrap up of this, I feel like there's a part two to this <laughs> If not this, a dispatcher's roundtable to just talk about compassion fatigue alone. We could do a whole hour just on that. That would be amazing to do. Um, but it, as, as we go into the wrap up of this, I, I, I have to ask, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of mentioned this with myself, but if you could go back in time to talk to yourself, what kind of advice would you tell you? Would you give yourself? Take a day off. Take a day off. The overtime is good, but it's not worth the long-term effects. And talk about it. You know, talk about those traumatic calls that are sticking with you. Find somebody that you trust to talk about it. Perfect. Thank you so much for being on. And uh, it's already going on you know pretty much an hour and stuff and it feels like we haven't even scratched the surface so we definitely need to do this again especially a dispatcher's roundtable episode on compassion fatigue um how can people find out more about you the research th that you're doing and just all of it you know is there an email social media any way to get a hold of you there is an email if you are interested or have experience with compassion fatigue and would like to participate in research 
um, I can leave it with you or you mm -hmm. can post it. Is that fine? Yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and share it here and uh, I'll make sure to post it as well when this episode and goes out. A John 209 at odu.edu. Perfect. Thank and you again. Thank oh, you. go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I be, would be more than happy to come back for a round table. I think that would be fun. Awesome. Awesome. Excellent. It, it would be an, an excellent topic to go over. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure up until this point, because we're going on almost uh, round 30 of the dispatchers round table. And I do <laughs> not think this has been like the, the main topic. So it would be really good to be able to do it. So we're going to get that figured out here. And uh, again, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll be right back here with you in just one moment. Uh, for those who are watching and listening, if you have any comments, questions, or you want to be a guest on the show, you can email us, and that's going to be wttpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. That is at 91podcast. You can uh, like us on Facebook, and that is facebook.com slash within the trenches podcast. This episode has been sponsored by Indigital Rapid Deploy as well as Carbine. And a shout out to patrons, as always. Thank you for everything. And a perk to patrons only is. Uh, those are audio versions of Open Mic Live as well as the DRT, which is the Dispatcher's Roundtable. And there's more rounds coming up, as you just heard right now. We are definitely going to be doing this round. And uh, if you're looking for any bonus content, again, for patrons, patreon.com slash WTT podcast. You can help and support us there. And uh, again, thank you, as always, for everything. You can see this episode on Facebook twitter as well as youtube i had to think about it for a moment there <laughs> and you can listen 24 7 on apple podcasts iHeartRadio, radio spotify your favorite podcasting app and within the trenches.net have a good one everyone and again happy national public safety telecommunicators week 2022 thank you for everything that you do as the most vital piece of public safety we'll see you in the next one